Some people dress to impress. I dress to still pretend that it's summer. Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill and uh, today I've got another story for you. It's uh, part three of Kilpuik and Olwen. If you're a new subscriber, one of the many fellow critters who've come to join us over here, I'm very happy to have you. I think you'll like this story, but you might want to you might, you might go and, uh, and watch from the first episode just so that this story makes sense. Or as much sense as it can make, because, I mean, spoiler alert, it doesn't make that much sense. But it's a fun one. A fun one. There's a card if you want to go check out episode one first and you can follow through and catch up with this here. So now where were we? Uh, Arthur's gang, his his Team O Knights, had just come with Kilhuach to try and win the hand of Olwen, daughter of Uspathaddon Pencor. And along the way they had met a strange, fire-breathing farm guy, shepherd man, who it turned out was married to Kilhuach's aunt. It was a whole thing. But anyhow, uh, they'd convinced Kilhuach's aunt to invite Olwen to uh, Kostenin's home so that they could talk to her face to face, get a little bit of a feel for what was happening. You know, lay some groundwork. Now the quest is really beginning. Olwen is gorgeous. No surprise there. Olwen's digging it. She likes the look of Kilhuach. She's gonna allow this. But she also kind of fills a role as a bit of a rubbish Medea. She says, oh man, you're gonna have to complete a bunch of tasks, but here I'll help you by telling you what to do. And he says, yeah, I'm listening, Kilhuk's ready, he's, he's all ears. And Olwen says, what you have to do is you have to complete all the tasks that my father requests. Yeah, thanks. That's, it's helpful information. Because it turns out that Uspathan will die the minute that his daughter gets married. Who knows why that is? A curse, maybe? Sure, I'll go with that. So Kilhuik and Kai and Bedawir and all the rest, they get themselves prepared and they follow Olwen back to her father's castle. And of course, uh, because this is a uh, half Arthurian legend, uh, they get up to the castle and they murder the nine porters on the way in silently, and then they kill the nine watchdogs before they can bark. Because, you know, why not kill everybody on your way in to a castle you want to be making a good impression at? Like, why would you not do that? I can't think of any reasons. So they get into the Great Hall, having murdered a bunch of people and pets, and they meet, finally, Aspathan Pencor. Aspathan? Aspathan? Aspathan. I can't remember anymore. Hail Aspathan, we come to win the hand of your daughter in the name of Kilhuch, son of Kilev. And Aspathan, as it turns out, has such big, bushy eyebrows, they're so heavy they droop over his eyes and stop him from seeing. So he has to call for his servants, for his pages, to come and lift his eyebrows up with a pair of forks so that he can see who's asking for the hand of his daughter. Hey, do I have a fork anywhere? Huh? Hey, who's that? Who's that? I can't see. Who's that? I can't... Oh! Hello, young man. Like something out of the labyrinth. Again, he says, quite plainly, come back tomorrow and see me then, and then I'll have an answer for you about whether or not you can marry my daughter. Kill who can co are like, sure, all right. We don't want to pick any fights. They turn around and start to leave. And Uspathan picks up a poison dart from next to him and chucks it at them while their backs are turned? What the hell, dude? I mean, I guess he's gonna die when she gets married. Right? But you know who's with the party? Yes, you do. Bedouir, who's the fastest fast guy in fast land. Bedouir snatches out and grabs the dart before it can hit anyone and throws it straight back at Uspathan. Who gets hit? In the knee! He took a dart to the knee! Look, they're just playing into my hands now. Ah, ah, said Aspathaton. You hit me in the knee with a poison dart! You're so rude! What a rude person who would do that to me, you know? I'm gonna walk with a limp forever now because of that. That's very mean. I'll remember this when I'm reviewing whether I want you to marry my daughter. Kill her work. I'll remember. Alright, sure. But the party comes back the next day, uh, ready and willing to, to make negotiations for getting that whole business with the poison iron dart. And now, Aspathan says, look, here's, here's, here's the deal. All of our great-grandparents are still alive, so I need to consult with them before I make any decisions about whether she can marry you, okay? Okay, boy? Alright, sure, whatever. I guess we'll, we'll go and eat some lunch and we'll come back again another time. How about that? That sound good? Great, we're just gonna, we're gonna go. 
and the party turn their backs and walk out again. Oh, and guess what happens? Uh, uh, the Thunder picks up a second poison dart from beside him and throws it again. This time, Manu the Magical is the one who catches the dart and lobs it back at us with that. This time pinning it right in the chest, right in the sternum. And it goes so far in that it's like sticking out of his back a little bit, which is, I mean, very gross. <sighs> they hit me with a dart, did you see that? They hit me with a poison dart, how rude is that? You know, I've got, now that I've got a poison dart in my chest, anytime I walk up hill, I'm gonna be wheezing. Oh. What an unkind potential son-in-law. For real, for real, is this, is this really ha this is really, this is what's happening. Okay. So again, the party come back the next day. Is it, is it any surprise that they've been staying at Kostenin's house rather than in the castle? They would absolutely be murdered in their sleep if they stayed in the castle. The party come back the next day to find out what all the great grandparents said. And Uspathan specifically says, don't you throw any more poison darts at me. What? I, are you, seriously? Gilho's like, dude, I just, can I just have an answer already? It's been three days. I would like to marry your daughter. We're willing to do all the negotiations and stuff and dowries all over the place. Come on, give us an answer, for real. And Aspathan goes, oh, oh, look, I'm, I'm gonna need my pages to lift my, pages, pages, I need you to lift my eyebrows so that I can make eye contact when I say this. All right, every, ready, here we go. And, uh, oh! and of, he throws the third dart. More poison darts everywhere. Is this visible in, oh, hey, hey flag. This time Kai has to catch the dart for himself and he throws it back at us but then, and it goes right into his eye because his eyebrows aren't there to protect him anymore. Ho -ho! Straight through his eye and into the back of his skull. Somehow he's fine. I mean, apart from the dart in his eye, but you know. <gasps> oh, my eye! Oh, what the, so rude! I'm gonna have really bad headaches from now on and that's all your fault. That's it, says Killhook. That's it, no more darts. Don't throw any more darts or I'm just gonna kill you now. There won't be no waiting till the wedding day, right? Hear me? All right, fine, let's negotiate. And so a chair is brought and put directly in front of uh, Aspathadon's throne in which Killhook may sit as they uh, converse and decide exactly what who will have to do in order to have this marriage approved. And I mean, I thought the six pages of names of Arthur's knights was a drag. Holy moly. There are seven or eight pages worth of, that's my phone, of Uspathan going, Oh, well, I mean, you're gonna have to do this really difficult thing if you want to marry my daughter. And then Kilhook responding, what, you think that's hard? That's not even hard. I can do that easy. And us but then would say, fine, you think that that's easy? Well, then you also have to do this. What? You think that that's hard? That's not even hard. My cousin is Arthur. King Arthur, all right? That'll be easy. I can do anything. Over and over again. I... Uh... I lost a part of my soul the day that I read through that. The Cliff's Notes version of it is that uh, basically Aspathan wants to get a haircut before the wedding. Wait, these people had haircuts, I have no answers. But because his hair is so manky, their words, he's gonna need a bunch of special items for it. The most important of which is uh, the scissors and comb which are stuck to the head, right, of this boar. This wild boar who's actually a prince who was cursed into becoming a wild boar, so they're gonna have to hunt the boar. But then, like, there's all these other mini quests that they're gonna have to do in order to be able to hunt the boar. It's like one of those things where, oh, you have to hunt the boar, but in order to do that, you'll need this person, and in order to get that person, you'll need to give them this sword, and to get that sword, you'll have to... Eight pages. So then what do they do? They go on a bunch of mini quests. First things first, uh, they go to this particular castle where they know they have to get a sword off uh, a king of giants. But they know that he will never give it willingly, um, but that he can only be killed by his own sword. So it's like one of those things, how are you gonna kill him when he's got his sword? He has a name. His name is Gurnach. Giant King Gurnach. It's a good name, isn't it? So they head off, they find this gigantic castle, and so the party, Team Arthur, the A-Team, they come to the gate and they meet a porter. And the porter says, Oh, who goes it? Kill who has dealt with this before. He doesn't want to deal with this again. Oh, I will not let you enter. No, 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 not this again, not this again. I, no, I'm not doing this again. The knife is in the meat. All right, that is it. Whoa, whoa, hey, 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 whoa, let's calm down for a second. We can just lie. 
all right? Of course Kai was the first one to think of lying. He's the party face. I would rather not, if we can help it, uh, begin an all-out brawl with a whole city of giants. So, like, how about we just think for all of two seconds? The only people who may enter are craftsmen. Oh, you... How you... I'm... I'm... A craftsman, said Kai. Oh, yeah? What's your craft then? I, uh, I, I, I burnish swords. I am a sword burnisher. That's me, craftsman, all the way. Burnishing them swords, day and night, all, all, all the time, Tw 24 hour, 24 seven, sword burnishing. And so Kai was allowed inside while everyone else had to wait out at the gate. But it's all good, because Kai is very, very good at lying. And thankfully, at burnishing swords. Gurunach! is pleased to hear that they've got uh, got a craftsman who can burnish swords coming into the city because he he needs one. His sword is getting rusted, it is getting blunt, he really needs someone to polish that blade. And so a chair is brought forth for Kai and placed directly in front of Gurunach's throne and the two begin to converse. First off, Kai shows what he can do by, uh, by sharpening one half of the giant's sword and asking whether Gurunach is pleased with his work so far. That is some great sword burnishing! I cannot believe that someone as skilled and friendly as you doesn't have a, doesn't have like a companion. I do actually, says Kai. I've got uh, my best buddy, Bedawir, who's, he's very skilled too. He just, uh, he doesn't know how to burnish a sword. What can I say? <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> you, oh you. All right. Have your best friend come in. He can come in too. I like, I like you. So Bedouir is shown into the castle, and as the gates are opened for Bedouir, the newbie, the new kid, uh, Goru, that's the son of Kastenan and uh, Kilhuasan, the one who was kept in the box. As it turns out, he's a really sneaky little mofo. Not only does he manage to sneak his way into the gates as they're opened for Bedouir, he manages to sneak everyone else in as well. And then immediately they go and they start killing everyone in all the castle lodgings because that's what they do. So much for avoiding a giant bloodbath. So they go and they murder everyone. Uh, in the meantime, Kai and Bedouir are back in the, uh, in the Great Hall. Kai finishes up sharpening the sword of the giant and says, you know what's rusted this sword? I can tell you, it's the sheath. The sheath is not good enough for this blade. It is letting the whole thing go to hell. But I can fix that for you. You are a master, says Gurunach. Come on up here and, and fix this sheath. And so Kai stands up and heads on over to the sheath at, uh, at Gurunach's waist, uh, and he promptly beheads the giant in one swing. And he and Bedouir clear the entire Great Hall and uh, the A-Team go ransacking the whole city and take all the jewels and stuff and head back to Arthur. They show back up at Arthur's palace carrying the head of King Gurunach. Hey Art, uh, we have so much to tell you. And Arthur says, all right, what's next? He's pulling off the gloves now. He's coming on their adventures with them. Hell to the yes. First up, we need to uh, save this guy who was kidnapped when he was three days old and no one's ever heard from him since. That should be easy, right? Hey, Gura here. You can speak every language, including animal languages. We're gonna need you to go and talk to the oldest animal in Britain, who's this, like, blackbird. And so they go and they find her and she says, oh, sorry, no, uh, I am really old, don't get me wrong, but uh, I've never heard of this guy that you're looking for. But you know who I have heard of? There's a stag who's even older than I am. I can show you to him. So the party go with Blackbird and they find the stag and, and they say, Hey stag, you're the oldest animal in Britain. How, can you tell us where this guy is? What happened to him? And the stag goes, Oh, oh no, don't get me wrong. I am really old, like, whoa. But uh, I have never heard of this dude. But you know who I have heard of? Actually, there's this owl who's even older than me. I can take, I can take you to him. So they go and they visit the owl and <laughs> can you guess what the owl said? The owl said, <laughs> I'm really old, don't get me wrong, but no, nah, I've never heard of this dude, but I have heard of an eagle who's even older than I am. So they go and they talk to the eagle, and the eagle at least breaks script a little bit. The eagle's like, I'm hella old, yo. So freaking old. And I have heard of this guy, but just the once, only one mention, and that was from this salmon, right? I was uh, searching far and wide for food, and I found this huge salmon. I tried to fish it out of the river, but it was so heavy and huge, it almost pulled me down. It almost drowned me. I was offended. I came and I collected all my eagle armies, and we went to attack the salmon. But the salmon 
sent some messengers to me. Goodness knows how that works. And he apologized, and we made a deal. And now we're friends after I helped him pull a bunch of spears out of his back because he's a giant. Did I mention that he's giant? Yeah, the salmon's a giant. A giant salmon. Let's go talk to the salmon. I'll introduce you, and we can find this dude. So now Gura here and friends, uh, surrounded by a small uh, gathering of the oldest animals in Britain, go find a river in Gloucester and uh, meet this old salmon. And the salmon says, oh, let me tell you, I know exactly where this dude is. It is a dark and troubled place, but I can give you a lift. Hop on my back, my giant salmon back. So Kai and Gura here, in order to translate, hop on the salmon's back and it swims them downstream until it comes to this castle that's right on the river in Gloucester. And they can hear this singing, this, this mournful, lamenting song. And they say, oh, who is that singing that mournful, lamenting song? It's me, Moben. Moben? Moden? His name's something like that. It's the guy that they're looking for. What? I don't... Sure. Kai and Bedouin ride the salmon downstream again and break through the wall in order to pull Moden or Moben out of his prison cell. Finally, he's free! The stories continue to be told in uh, strange little disconnected chunks. There's a thing where they go and they find a werewolf and her two cubs and they get turned into humans again. That one turned out to be easy. There's one where uh, some guy from Arthur's court is walking along and he hears the weirdest screaming he's ever heard and he saves an anthill from a fire. And so the ants bestow upon him their blessing. And now cut back to Kai and Benwe once again sitting atop a uh, beacon pyre up on a huge windy mountaintop and they're looking out from their cute date spot and they see this huge billowing cloud of smoke that's going against the wind. And somehow they know that it's a rubber. It's rubber fire. That's the only fire that can fight the wind is rubbers. Lighting fires. They go to investigate. They find out that it's this dude that Kai has dealt with before. The greatest rubber in the land, Dillus. Dillus Vabauk. The silliest name for the deadliest of robbers. He was one of few robbers to have ever escaped Arthur, and so Kai really wanted to just jump up and fight him right then, but they remembered that uh, one of the things they needed in order to hunt the boar was a leash for a dog that was made out of Dillis's beard hair, but the beard hair had to be uh, plucked from his face while he was alive with wooden tweezers. Goodness knows why. I just, can people just make out like stipulations, like prophetic stipulations on things as as they're speaking, because that's, it seems like that's what's happening. They wait for him to uh, eat all this food and tire himself out and fall asleep, and then Kai digs a huge pit, and he knocks Dillis out and tosses him in the pit, uh, and then they use the wooden tweezers that he and Bedouin had been making while they waited for Dillis to finish his food, and they pluck out all his beard hairs, and then they kill him. They come home after risking life and limb, hand over this leash to King Arthur, who promptly drops a diss track against Kai? Like, what's that about, Arthur? What the hell are you doing, bro? And when I say, I mean, literally, he, he made a, a song that made fun of Kai, and Kai was so offended that he swore never to help Arthur ever again and he left their company and he leaves the story and my heart is broken. I really got attached to Kai. So while I am in emotional turmoil, that seems like a good place to stop the story for now because we're getting close to the actual hunting of the actual boar with the actual name that I can't pronounce. So I hope that you enjoyed that video. If you're new here, this is the kind of thing that I do a lot of the time. If you're into D&D, you're probably into mythology too. I know how brains work. Maybe that's just because I'm into both, but it feels like you should be interested. It's fun. Uh, I have a Patreon that's linked in the description, as well as a bunch of social media links if you want to support the video. There's all the ways to do that. It's YouTube, you know how it works. Apart from that, I do believe that that's it. I'm done, and I will see you some other time. I found a hat while I was standing over there. Oh, shoot. Apparently, I had no card in my microphone that entire time, so, uh, this is the life we're living now. This is the sound that, that I'm cursed with forevermore.